Hey folks, welcome back to Ntaba Africa on this lovely 19th of November. Chris here, uh, and I'm um, coming to you live from Central Pennsylvania. My special feature guest today will be uh, former USA Eagle Captain Blaine Scully. We'll have him on just a moment, but before we get started, I thought it'd be really interesting for folks uh, to see his farewell video from USA Rugby. So we're going to play that right now, and then we'll get started with Blaine on the channel shortly after it's, afterwards I'll introduce him. So just a moment here, folks. Here comes the video from USA Rugby. Enjoy this. It is with a heavy but grateful heart that I officially announce my retirement from the sport of rugby. Sport is special, it teaches, tests, and offers feedback in its honest and sometimes brutal way. It inspires our passion to grow, to be better, and always offers the challenge of next week. Good work. But sport is also temporary. At some point, the game must move on, and that's okay. No matter how much we love it, no matter how much we care, it is important to remember, it's just a game. It's a difficult thing to say that I will no longer be a professional international rugby player. What I love so much about the game is how it challenged me in every imaginable way. Whether it was in defense or attack, in the air or on the ground, in the meeting room or at training, the challenge was set, not alone, but with a group, a team that you respect and trust, will always be what I miss the most. For over 10 years, I have accepted the responsibility of the U.S. jersey and hope to live up to what it means to be an Eagle. I am proud of what I did. It was the honor of my life to represent the United States. But as the great Bill Russell said, you play until there are no games left in your jersey. It's my turn to give it back. My career has never been defined by the number of international caps or the contract signed, but by the way I competed, the way I prepared each day as a professional the type of teammate I was, the way I represented my country, and the way I played the game. He's in! The USA have a vital score right For me, this is more of an opportunity to say thank you. Friends, teammates, and opponents, coaches, and fans, and to the clubs, and countries, and of course the game itself. You have my deepest thanks for the experience of a lifetime. As I move forward to face life's changes, and there are no more tackles to be made or high balls to be caught, rugby will always be a part of me. It's just the start of a world that I haven't yet found. My life isn't narrowing, it's expanding. I'm left filled with gratitude and hope, thankful for what I have, the people that have impacted me, and how I'm leaving the game. I look forward to the next tackle. Wow, folks, I'll tell you what, it's going to be tough to top that. That's quite an impressive video from USA Rugby and quite a farewell from Blaine. Uh, wonderful quotes there and great sentiments about the game of rugby. Folks, if you're unfamiliar with Blaine Scully, then you don't know much about USA Eagles rugby. But let me just give you a little background as we bring him in here in just a moment. Uh, he played fullback and wing throughout his career. He was the Eagles captain, also co-captain with Todd Clever, uh, one of the most famous USA rugby players. He played uh, for both the Cardiff Blues and the Leicester Tigers. And uh, also, a lot of people don't know this, but uh, you know you have a lot of uh, players associations and unions for leagues. Um, the USA Rugby Players Association is a co-founder of that with James Gillenwater. And uh, he's got a lot of appearances uh, in professional rugby, as well as for the Eagles. I believe 54 appearances for the Eagles. We'll talk to him just a moment about that. Also played USA Sevens, uh, I think in nine tournaments total. He studied UCLA and then transferred to Cal Berkeley, uh, UC Berkeley, and uh, competed in the Collegiate Rugby Championship down here in Philadelphia, just a couple hours from where I'm sitting at. And uh, this is interesting uh, for uh, folks. Uh, Blaine and I both have a degree in history, so it will be interesting to talk about that. So with that, folks, let me welcome into the program this is USA Eagle, Blaine Scully, and there he is, folks. Welcome to the stream, Blaine. Thanks for having me. No, it's, it's awesome. Thanks for getting back with me. Uh, I first reached out to Blaine back in July, but he's been quite the busy beaver trying to build a <laughs> post-rugby career, and so he was quite busy, but uh, I think he missed my message. But when he saw it the next time, he was right on it and said, yeah, I'd love to come on the program. So glad to have you on, Blaine. Yeah, well, I, I also had a newborn baby at that point, too, so I was in uh, – probably in the middle of nap time and and uh and bottle feeding so uh but very happy to join you 
<laughs> well, that, well, that's always a challenge. That, that'll fill up your days and nights and keep you going quite a bit. Uh, so congratulations on the newborn there. That's, that's awesome news as well. Yeah, our first, our first one. So um, it was you know, unattended, but I guess in so many ways during these, these difficult times, it's nice to be reminded of, of the little blessings like uh, our new baby girl and uh, whose name is Sadie. And uh, so we're, we're, we're in love for sure. Well, one thing's for sure with this unfortunate situation and because of COVID-19 and people being at home far more than they normally would be, certainly gives you a lot of time to bond with your child at an early stage of her life. Um, when you, A lot of times, given given the uh, career that you've had and what you've been involved with, I think it's pretty likely you'd probably be traveling around the world uh, if you were not uh, not at home. So it's just probably a good benefit for your daughter. Yeah, well, I mean, I was saying to... Uh to my wife the other day, it will be the first time I haven't left the United States if, if, uh, um, we don't, we don't leave the country. So my passport's been, been gathering dust, but as you said, I mean, that was sort of the intention of, of coming home and moving home was to be closer to family, kind of start on this new journey after making tackles for a living and, and really enjoying what, what that was like. Um, and, uh, unfortunately I haven't got to see my family in California too much because we're, we've, we settled uh, close to my uh, wife's family in New Jersey, uh, likely going to be moving down to the D.C., Northern Virginia area in the, in the coming months. Um, but, yeah, I, I guess in so, some ways I retired uh, at, a, at a very interesting time um, from, a, from a career transition standpoint. There's always going to be some sort of transitional element, I'm sure, as you can appreciate being uh, in a – sort of very um, regimented, scheduled environment where you knew what you needed to do in order to prepare day in and day out. And and all of a sudden, again, I was probably as prepared as, as anyone for that transition, or I'd like to think I was, but um, it's it's uh, it's a learning experience, which which I'm really enjoying. No, absolutely. You know, it's it's interesting that you make that, that comparison. It's one that, I mean, I've thought about, but I haven't spent a lot of time thinking about it. I, I thought about it from a personal standpoint, but I guess in a broader context, there's always people uh, moving from one career field or from one one phase of their life to another phase. And and in your case and in my case, uh, you announced your retirement, I think it was in March of this year from Test Rugby. Is that correct? That's correct, yeah. yeah so March of this year. So for me, um, I, I didn't have a choice to leave. I mean, it was, it's by law. I served the maximum time I could as a, as a colonel. Uh, and so I retired after 36 years. But So for me, it was October. But I re- didn't really get into starting the next phase. I prepared for it the past several years. But I wasn't really going to start until about February, March, April time frame. So, um, I, you know, that transition because of what's happened in the world with Wuhan coronavirus, COVID-19 is – Probably been very interesting for folks like you and I who are going from something to, to a new phase. But I think in both our cases, we're both relying on our experiences and, and using that for the next phase. So uh, will you be getting into broadcasting? I, I think you've done a little bit of uh, broadcasting. Yeah, so I, I've done a little bit of that, although I haven't done uh, – I haven't been back in the studio for, for a few months now. I'm actually going back to school. I'm going to – in, in uh, January, I'll be uh, – I actually haven't even announced this publicly. This will be the first time I've said, said so. Uh, I'll be I'll be going to Oxford for my executive MBA, so I'm pretty excited about that. Um, and uh, again, you know, sort of, you know, trying to identify and understand where I fit. So I've done some general consulting, advisory work with a few different sport technology companies. You know, looking at media, looking at you know potentially the finance world and the intersection of sport and 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 uh, private equity has become a really interesting sort of space and, you know, maybe do something entirely different as well. Um, yeah, I, that I'm not necessarily quite sure yet, but my objective is to be as open as possible to anything and everything and, and sort of let my curiosity drive a, a lot of what I, you know, do. And, and, you know, again, at the end of the day, try to find something, um, you know, that I can connect with in, in, in sort of the same way I was able to with sport. No, I think it's a great approach. The world really is your oyster. Uh, people that try to limit themselves, uh, I, I think that's self-defeating. Uh, there are so many different things people can do out there. Uh, you certainly have the affable personality that uh, will get you into all the fields you just talked about, and you'll probably be quite successful in all those. Now, you grew up in California, but um, you got into rugby. I mean, soccer's huge in California. How did you get into rugby, and when did that happen? Because guys like Perry Baker don't get into it until late in life. Yeah. And when I say yeah. late in life, they're not 70, but you know what I mean. They didn't, yeah, they, yeah, yeah. It was yeah. much later. But I mean, I you know, in South Africa and in England, people are playing rugby when they're six years yeah. old. So, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, there's actually it's incredible rugby history in Northern California. So you think about 
the 1920, 1924 Olympians. They were mainly from, you know, Cal, Stanford, uh, Santa Clara, all that Northern California region. You know, I'm from Sacramento, which you know, has a quite a bit of rugby. I went to Jesuit High School, which is a you know pretty well known rugby playing high school. Uh, although I didn't play in high school, I drove by the rugby field every day. I I was basketball, water polo, and swimming. And originally, the intention was to play college water polo. But um, you know, I guess I, I kind of knew it wasn't what I was supposed to do, or the uh, somebody knew it wasn't what I was supposed to do and ended up finding rugby uh, as a college uh, freshman introduced by one of my former high school friends and uh, knew this was what I was supposed to do. So I ended up chasing that around for uh, just uh, over a decade. And uh, I mean, what an incredible journey, what an incredible experience, the friends I met, the, the, uh, the separated shoulders I now have as, as, uh, as a reward <laughs> for, yeah, for you, that. You probably um, could have done without uh, those. <laughs> yeah. I, I, but I wouldn't trade it for the world. I, I mean, it's just incredible experience. And, and really for me, it was, it was sort of an exercise and, you know, being as good as I possibly could be at something and trying to achieve. And, uh, it's just an incredible forum to try to do that. And, and the folks you meet and learn how to be a team, a teammate and be on, teams and compete for your country. It's just all, it was all really meaningful for me. Well, you went to UCLA for a couple of years, uh, University of California, Los Angeles. Then you transferred UC Berkeley, um, Cal Bears. Uh, what, what, uh, what happened there? Why did, did you, did, cause you're a history student with this different program or did you go because of rugby or what was the transfer about? Or if it's a secret, you don't yeah. have to tell us. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's quite, it's quite all right. Um, yeah, I suppose I transferred for, all the reasons the kid transfers. I'm from Northern California and, you know, the idea of being closer to Sacramento, um, you know, that there was probably a bit of the rugby element as well. And, and knowing that it's what I needed to do uh, or what I wanted to do and, and, and to learn from some of the, uh, um, you know, best rugby minds and, and, in, in, in the country. Um, and, and also, you know, I was, I was a student and, and I felt, you know, Cal was a, was the best fit for me moving forward. And so that was, you know, probably the reason why I made a decision more than anything else is, I mean, as you kind of appreciate when you're, when you're young, it, 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 you, you, I guess you, you sort of, you don't necessarily know right away, but then you start to get a better and clearer picture around the direction you want to go. And then you make some decisions to hopefully support uh, your, your transition on that path. So, and that was probably the main thing. No, I mean, those are great reasons. I uh, I recently um, I went to Oaxaca because my mother's not well, and I came back a couple of days ago and actually went down to campus where I was an undergraduate at Ohio University. So that was uh, quite an interesting experience. Of course, it's a ghost town because only a small percentage of students are allowed on campus because of the, uh-huh. the COVID. So it was kind of weird to be walking around the campus when almost no one's there, but uh, it was quite a good experience to get back on campus once again. But, I mean, you made a good choice, I mean, as far as from a rugby standpoint. I mean, the Cal, my goodness. I mean, the CRC, the Collegiate Rugby Championship over here in Chester, frankly, i got to be honest, uh, I almost didn't want to go anymore because it got kind of boring. Like, Cal wins all the time. <laughs> no, but to be fair, actually, yeah. in the interest of Full disclosure before you, Blaine. Actually, I, I got less interested because um, Cal pulled out of the tournament, and I didn't think the tournament was nearly as good with Cal's absence. So, uh, but they did come yep. back, and uh, but this year it didn't happen. So, yeah. Um, what was the CRC like for you? Because uh, that's an interesting tournament to say the least. Yeah, it was. It was a. Uh, it was a great. Um, it was a great thing for college rugby. Uh, I, I was at the first two, um, so the first one was in Ohio, actually, and the second one was was in Philly. And, uh, I mean, it was, it was a fantastic event. I had played on the U S team at that point, uh, in a couple of the HSBC sevens tournaments. And, uh, yeah, I, I felt every bit of, of the same jitters, uh, playing at the CRC, just the, you know, being on NBC and having all these name brand schools, um, and competing for on behalf of your university. I mean, it was just what you hope, you know, college rugby could look like in, in, in the next decade. Right. Um, just a really well done event. No, absolutely. I have to say it is well done because they also have uh, high school teams out there. They do tournaments outside while it's going on. So that's kind of great to get more people involved in the game of rugby. And you're right. NBC does the coverage, which has been brilliant. It's been fantastic. I, I really enjoy going there, uh, to see all these, uh, college players and see, well, gosh, okay. That, that, that guy, that gal is going to be on the Eagles. I can just see it. I can see mm-hmm. it. And mm-hmm. uh, I think uh, year before last, uh, Mike Friday came up with um, 
Anaya Tapper, I think, was there, and um, uh, who else was there? Perry Baker was a couple others, Madison Hughes. It was really great to see those guys there. Of course, Madison played for Dartmouth, played in the CRC as yep. well. So uh, he's an alumnus. Chris Thomas was there as well. Um, she was great to have along. So it's always nice to see yep. that. But uh, a lot of people don't know that uh, we have uh, quite the rugby uh, history here in the United States. They, they, because we were not a professional sport, and when, until the the one year aborted effort with pro rugby, which just lasted one season, but now we've got major league rugby. But before that, uh, we didn't have professional rugby here, uh, and so people don't look at the USA as a rugby nation. But as you alluded to earlier, we won the 1920 and 1924 Olympics, surprised the world, I think, back then. Uh, then we didn't win anything until a long time after that, but. Um, we had a long history, but it's been at the club level and university level. It's not been a professional sport until recently. And so uh, I think that's one reason why a lot of people don't think of the United States and think of rugby. But uh, we have among the highest number of registered rugby players uh, and of any country in the world. And it's been around for a long time. Uh, so uh, it's, it's a shame that people don't look at the USA and think of rugby. But do you think that we might be starting to gain traction? That's been an argument people have been having for 30 years that USA rugby is on the verge of bursting out. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think we definitely have, um, you know, some momentum. And, and as you alluded to, I, I mean, there is some, you know, pretty incredible history. At Cal, we're the oldest sport on campus, right? And, you know, that's a really kind of cool, unique uh, touch point that we have in connection to the school and and, uh, and to the game in general. Uh, I mean, I think there's, there's a lot to be positive about uh, as far as the sports overall you know, potential, but there's an incredible amount of work to do. I'm, I'm, you know, I try to stay, you know, relatively measured with, you know, future projections based on the sports, you know, potential versus where it is. But then how do you sort of scale to that? So I think, you know, I, I, I sort of shy away from the whole sleeping giant thing because I just I think it's pretty lazy in the sense that, you know, there's a lot of people who are working really, really hard at growing the game every day. Um, now, I think what they mean is that we have you know, tons of really good athletes, which we do. We have a lot of, um, you know, engaged, you know, fans and of lots of sports, which we do. We have, you know, incredible sports market, the most competitive in any world as far as dollars being spent, which, you know, again, sort of creates an environment where rugby could find a place. And then, you know, based on the sheer scale of our country, really kind of take off in comparison to the rest of the world. But, I mean, as you kind of said, it takes a lot of work from, the interscholastic youth to through college system, which is obviously really important for rugby to work here. We don't really do academies uh, in the same way that they do in other parts of the world. And then the major league rugby being able to provide sort of that aspiration um, and also, you know, geographic footprints across the country, which are really important from an infrastructure point of view. Um, and, you know, hopefully we can continue to achieve and, and be as competitive as possible on the international stage as well from a national team perspective. So, I mean, th there's a lot in there. And, and like I said, we have a lot of work to do, but there, there's potentially s some stuff to look forward to as well. No, absolutely. And that's, uh, you know, while I've, um, I'm a big fan of Major League Rugby and a big supporter for it from the outset, I'm also realistic. It's it's great. And I'm glad it's successful. And I hope that uh, the uh, teams are profitable. But until we put more than three or 5,000 people in seats for games, we really, really haven't gotten where we need to get. So I think it takes a long time to get there, as you said, uh, a smart approach to that. But uh, it is encouraging, I think, that we actually have an opportunity for players to progress all the way up to potentially a professional level. Also, we, we seem to be getting a, a fair number of talented and experienced folks uh, coming over from elsewhere. And, and uh, contrary to what some people have claimed, they're not past it. You know, Joe Peterson's not past it. Uh, ben Foden's not past it. Uh, we've had Bostero came over this year from Major League Rugby. We had Cathal Marsh was here. A lot of international players are um, coming over playing Major League Rugby. For such a new league, it's actually, I think, encouraging. And we'll see where it goes from here. But uh, it's kind of exciting to see Major League Rugby get off and have professional rugby in the States. Uh, you had to go abroad to play professional rugby. And so you went to Leicester and signed a contract with Leicester. And, uh, look, I've never watched you play at Leicester, but I know some people from Leicester. And when your name is mentioned, they, they seem to love you. Um, they absolutely, uh, you were very much a fan favorite. At least that's what I hear in Leicester. Is that a true story? Uh, they were very nice to me, uh, for sure. They were very kind. So I, I went on Leicester on a trial right i was a, i was a two-week trialist and you know two weeks turned into four weeks which you know, turned into a couple years um it was a really hard decision to leave leicester um again you just you, you have to make hard decisions in professional sport and business in general and that's sort of the, the challenge of, of being a professional sportsman is always balance your 
your passion versus, you know, what's the most responsible thing to do from, from a, uh, from a career standpoint. Um, but you know, I, I loved, I loved my time at Leicester, incredible fans, incredible rugby history and culture. Uh, I mean, Welford Row is just an incredible place to play. And I mean, I think I, I, all I tried to do was, was play as hard as I could. And, and, you know, I enjoyed every minute I was there and I, I wasn't afraid to sort of express that. And I think, you know, kind of people appreciate someone who gives, gives their all and, and, and then give something back to the crowd on occasion as well. So, and that's, that was really kind of how I tried to live my, my life and, and play the game is just give it everything you can and, and don't be afraid to show that you're having fun either. <laughs> it's kind of what you're there for, right? I, exactly. I mean, it's just, if you're not yeah. enjoying it, what's the point? So, I mean, it's, it's fine yeah, exactly. to potentially make a living off of, it, but if you're not enjoying it, you're just miserable. I mean, unless you're a Shirley McLean or a Buddhist, as far as I know, you just get uh, one, one shot at this, <laughs> this path in life. So make the most of it. So I agree with you on that. Uh, I'm going to ask a question, then we'll switch to the card of blues. But this sure. is a question from the chat here from Landon. Landon says uh, he's seen quite a few South Africans leaving to play in the U.S., and that's a true statement there. He says, uh, how do you feel about people from other countries coming to the U.S. and eventually representing the U.S. Uh, too? I presume he means the Eagles. Right. Uh, I mean, I think it's a, it's a fair question. I mean, in, in some ways, uh, that's sort of America, isn't it? Right. I mean, you have folks who come from all over the world who – you know, see opportunities to go to university or professional opportunities, whatever those might might be. Uh, I mean, I think it's it's probably a it's a challenge for Major League Rugby to make sure that um, the the overall value and uh, uh, from a competition standpoint is is at a high level, but at the same time, you know, that competition is is enhanced by overseas talent, but at the same time, it can't restrict opportunities, say from domestic players from, you know, achieving, you know, a uh, professional contract. So again, that's, that's sort of a, a, a challenging one to work through, but you know, I, I don't really have any um, issues with any of that. It's just, it's just all balance. No, absolutely. So you mentioned uh, th- this question that the person asked in chat about international players coming over. So, for instance, uh, you know, a couple years ago when Major League Rugby got started, um, I had uh, had to pick a team, and there was no East Coast team. And so I'm like, who do I want to support? Um, uh, the Texas squad? No, nah, I can't do that. Um, Seattle? No, nah, I can't do that. So I said, ah, oh, the Utah Warriors. I like the logo. It's Utah. Beautiful place. I like it. So I said, I'm going to be a Utah fan until we get an East Coast team. And uh, so I supported uh, the Warriors. And so I ordered a jersey, okay? And I didn't get it. I'm like, where's my jersey at? So I called them and I said, listen, uh, guys, um, not to be rude or anything, but I ordered this jersey weeks ago and I haven't seen it shipped. Is there something wrong? And the guy says, oh, no, you have to understand we're just getting started here. It's new. I apologize. Hang on a second. Let me, let me, one of the players is here. Why don't you chat with him while I check on your order? And he goes, yeah, hi, this is Paul Lasica. How are you doing? Uh, hey, thanks a lot for supporting the Warriors. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. And, and that kind of leads me into uh, where I was going to go next with this, uh, Blaine, is that I think for people um, who follow rugby, one of the great things about it is that uh, now I'm sure there's probably a few prima donnas somewhere, but I've never met any prima donnas. Uh, you get that in other professional sports, and maybe it's because rugby too is a relatively junior professional sport. I mean, even internationally, it didn't start till 95, so it's not been that long. But, but I mean, everybody I've ever met in rugby, whether it's uh, it's um, Dan Norton or it's, it's uh, Perry Perry Baker, or it's uh, it's you, or it's uh, Brian Habana. Everybody's approachable. Um, the athletes are approachable, and uh, I'm sure everybody has their bad days. But but uh, I've never really seen a bad experience with with rugby players. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why a lot of people who grow to like the game really like it because players are approachable and they're just regular guys and gals for the most part. Um, do you think that's a fair statement? Yeah, I mean, I think that's why I love the game. Right, I love. Um, the you know, culture and ethos associated with being a value driven sport. I think that's, you know, really healthy and positive and important. Um, you know, the sportsmanship aspect of the game where you can you know, kind of go head, head to toe for 80 minutes and still look somebody in the eye and shake their hand. Um, you know, the fact that the game's really inclusive and open, um, you know, these are all really positive things that as you kind of, say or attract maybe a certain type of person to the game. Um, yeah, but at, at, you're right. I, I think there's hopefully, and it's one of rugby is one of the challenges for the future. So how do you kind of maintain and keep those core elements that, you know, are so, um, 
unique and special to the sport, but at the same time, kind of, you know, modernizing the way every business and sport has to in the 21st century. Um, so it'll be a real challenge for the game, but you now you hope that, that we're always able to maintain that, that sort of human element to it. No, I absolutely agree. And then David in the chat says, rugby fans will bry together. Soccer fans need to be separated. It's true. Uh, when I went to the World Cup in 2015, yeah. I went to Brighton and uh, and I went down there for the South Africa-Japan game. And then I was there for the USA-Samoa uh, game after that. I think it was Samoa. Yeah, it was Samoa after that. Yeah. And I went for the, 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 the Springboks game and... Uh, I tried to enter the stadium. They said, you can't enter. I'm like, I have a ticket. Go, no, you can't enter. I'm like, what's wrong with my ticket? It's not fraudulent. I bought it from the, I brought it from the World Cup. No, no, sir, you can't enter here. Okay, where do I enter? You have to walk all the way around the stadium. I'm like, why is that? And when I entered, I realized why. Because the soccer fans get so pissed and liquored up that um, – they used to beat each other up and attack each other. People get killed in the stands. And so they made mm. turnstiles. You can only go into certain parts of the arena or the stadium, which is frustrating. You know, as Americans and, and other countries, we're accustomed to walking around the stadium during intermission or halftime or break and such. And so it was really weird. Uh, but I discovered that's uh, that's because of soccer fans in England. So uh, I prefer to go yeah. to a rugby-specific pitch so that I can walk around <laughs> the arena. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I hear you. Pretty crazy stuff there. But no, it's uh, not to beat up on soccer, but I think that's a fair statement. I mean, we sadly know the history of uh, soccer hooligans. And fortunately, we don't have those in rugby. And let's hope that, as you said, we keep it uh, straight like that. So let me, let me shift gears a little bit there, Blaine. Uh, you studied yep. history. Uh, what sort of history did you study? I, I focused on African history. What, what was your focus? Uh, American history. Um, so I, my plan there was – I was – you know, initially my plan was to go to law school after university, but I ended up – making tackles for a lot longer than I thought I would. So, uh, you know, maybe eventually still go back after I finish my, my, uh, my MBA, but um, yeah, that was kind of my plan. I, I've always been a student of history. I, I, I love the stories of people and, and, you know, learning and understanding a bit deeper of why things are the way they are and, and how they kind of came to be. So um, yeah, I, wrote my thesis on um the Tuskegee airmen and and how their performance in world war ii led to desegregation of of the army um which was you know really fascinating you know dive into um you know kind of again more american rooted uh um uh concepts around you know that that era of 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 our history and, and, and something really, really positive that, you know, I just thought was really impactful and unique. So uh, I, I'm, I'm a big believer on, on, in studying history, learning from it as much as you can, because it's really the story of, of, of people and the story of us in so many ways. No, absolutely. I agree with that. And then you picked a fantastic topic. The Tuskegee Airmen are a great uh, part of our history and something to be quite proud of. Uh, they did a bang up job. I think there's a couple of them still alive today. One or two, I think. Um, it's just amazing um, what they accomplished during the war. Um, fantastic. Uh, and all that they overcame. And of course, famously, um, our federal government wasn't segregated, but President Wilson segregated the civil service shamefully uh, in his, yeah. during his administration, which is disgraceful. But um, after that, the first institution of the federal government that was desegregated was, of course, the Army. And that was by directive of President Truman. Thank goodness for that, that executive order. And so we finally ended segregation of the military back there in the early 1950s, which was fantastic. And uh, But the Tuskegee Airmen, great, great topic. Um, you know, I took I, I took um, the um, CLEP test. I don't know if you're familiar with the, the College Level Examination Program. It's uh, exams you can take. Okay. You can get college credit yeah. rather than 10 courses if you have experience and knowledge. So when I was in the yeah. Army going to school at night, I was working on my associate's degree because you and I talked before the stream. I went to college for a year and then yep. went into the Army. So I was working on an associate's degree at night, and so I took a few CLEP tests, and I took one for African-American history. And most of the guys that worked within the motor pool in my signal unit uh, were, were, were black or Puerto Rican. It was about one-third white, one third black, one third Puerto Rican. And uh, I walked back down because back in those days, there was no internet. So you had to wait weeks for your, your score to come back in the mail. So I went to, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I went to the education center. Oh, click. dial up. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, yeah. no, we didn't even have that back then. I mean, that, that was, that was, yeah, but, yeah. but uh, no, so it, my score came in the mail. I went to the education center, I collected it, and I walked back, and the maximum you could get was three semester hours, and I think the score on the test was like a maximum of 80. It was some kind of adjusted scale. And so I walked the motor pole, and guys like, Wyatt, how'd you do? How'd you do? I said, um, I got 78 out of 80, um, so I got three hours. Like, what? How'd you do that? I mean, how did you do so well on an African-American history <sighs> test? I said, because it's American history, man. <laughs> 
-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's American history. Why wouldn't I know about African American history? It's all part of our history. Yep. So um, the fact that they broke right. it out into a separate course just made it easier for me to get one college class out of the way I didn't have to take. Right. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. yeah. No, it worked out pretty well for me though. But I really enjoyed that. So, so do you still have an interest in history? Is it something you follow? Or yeah, yeah. I actually, I'm, I'm a closet nerd, I guess. So I, I've just finished up a class on on. Uh, Sort of the history of the American Revolution. So, um, you know, again, I'm, I, I I try to read a fiction and a nonfiction book always at the same time, and and uh, you know, like I said, I'm you know, whether it's ancient history to American history, I'm I'm kind of there. Awesome. Folks, you're listening to Chris White Africa on the Adobe Africa channel. My special feature guest today is the one, the only, Blaine Scully, former USA Eagle captain, co-captain with Todd Clever as well. Also played for Sevens, played at Leicester, played at Cardiff, had quite the interesting career. And um, now he's uh, announced his uh, retirement early this year from Test Rugby, and uh, he's moving into other spheres. And as you mentioned here, in a, a bit of a coup, we found out that he's going to Oxford to do his executive MBA. That's Yeah, you guys can't tell anybody yet, though. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll we'll keep it a secret. I'll delete that part of the program. <laughs> but uh, that's funny. So you, you did play in HSBC Sevens. Um, did you have a favorite uh, tournament that you went to? A lot of people love Hong Kong. A lot of people like Dubai. Strangely enough. Yeah. No. I um, I was injured back in 2012 before Hong Kong, so I never got to go there. Um, you know, Wellington was great, and then I, I mainly because of my university schedule was only able to play in the European legs. So, um, yeah, Twickenham is, is, is a fantastic to play rugby. Uh, and, um, so, I mean, I'd probably say, yeah, somewhere like, but then Edinburgh was equally kind of amazing because that was my first tournament. So I'll, I'll say Edinburgh. Oh, that's pretty cool. Um, yeah, Twickenham would be amazing. Uh, I've been to rugby all over the United Kingdom, and I have yet to be to uh, Murrayfield or or Twickenham. Uh, those, those are the two places yeah. I have to go and haven't been to either one. I have been to Millennium yeah. Stadium, which they just renamed in, in Cardiff. But the Blues don't play in yeah. Millennium Stadium, do they? They play in the stadium behind you. Well, we we play there on occasion. Um, so this is the Arms Park here, this this pitch here. And then the you know, Millennium, which is now called the Principality, is the – the monstrosity in the background. So um, we usually play our Judgment Day match against one of the other regions, typically the Ospreys in in the state in the Principality. Um, but yeah, I mean, an incredible place to play rugby. Oh no, it is. My, my first time there was during the uh, the Olympics, the uh, the London Olympics. They I went down there to watch South Korea play against um, England in uh, soccer, and um, I'm not a big fan of soccer. I actually literally sat in the top row there were no rows above me <laughs> it's it's quite a ways up there and you got to be physically in shape uh, to climb those steps are almost near vertical going up but then for the yeah. rugby world cup in 2015 i had much better seats i was sitting down close to the pitch on the sidelines and um it was amazing for the world cup i, I i'm so i mean I, I would i would never tell people that actually went to millennium or principal i can't use to call it principal but i would never say i went to millennium if i had never watched a rugby game there i mean because how can you go there and mm -hmm. not watch rugby uh so for yeah, a long yeah, time yeah. a long time i I didn't really share that I've been there until uh, because I yeah. only watch soccer in it, but uh, quite an amazing place. Um, where's, where's your favorite place to have played then uh, when you played over there? Um, man, there's so many good stadiums. Well, Twickenham's kind of a mess. That's a tough one. I, I think, well, yeah, it is. But I, I'd say uh, Clermont in France. Uh, oh. We played a, we played a, Heineken Cup quarterfinal game there, and it's just it was an incredible place to play. And part of it's just the context playing in a European knockout game and how loud and rambunctious they are. It was just a, an incredible memory. No, the French are amazing. It's surprising how into rugby the French really are. It's uh, for me, it was something. I went there for the Women's World Cup, and I went to Stade Jean Boin in Paris, and um, the crowds were just absolutely amazing for all the teams. They were just rooting them all. Yeah, up. they really, really, really do love rugby in France. It's it's quite quite yeah, surprising. they do. They really do. Now, when you were at Cal, you guys won the national championship twice. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. And who did you who did you guys play in those two championships? Uh, BYU in both. Oh, in both of them. Okay. And uh, how did it go? Because mm -hmm. I, I wasn't a fan of yours back then. So how, how did it go? Did you guys beat them? No, we, we, well, I, I, so we, we lost my first year at Cal to BYU. 
and then we won the final two. And I mean, they're always super competitive games. I mean, the Cal versus BYU game felt, felt like a test match back then. Um, but yeah, great memories. So uh, the Brew, who's in South Africa, asked me to ask you um, who your top three players are and why. I presume he means who you played against. That I played, played against? Yeah, uh, m- maybe you have different top three for who you played against, and then we can ask you who your favorite three you played with are. But oh, that might put man, you well, that played. might put you in a bind with some other Eagles. But <laughs> No, I mean, there's so many players. I mean, I played against, you know, so many, so many of the greats from Dan Carter to Brian Habana to uh, – some not very um, nice people to tackle, like uh, um, you know, Barry Nicky, Ganova, Fiji, um, incredible player who I played against and with. Um, yeah, you know, uh, I've had a number of those players, and, and again, again, it's you just can go down the list around people who have been, you know, incredible players who you've been really enjoyed competing against. Yeah, uh, I've I've had the good fortune of being the top top end of the game long enough to to sort of make the rounds I, I think the only team i actually didn't play um that's in say the top 15 or 20 teams would be wales actually and i played there for four years so uh, i played and uh, so i played against pretty much everybody in the last since 2010 2011 so um if if uh yeah from brian o'driscoll to who you you name Victor Matfield you name it so well I'll tell you what I was uh, when I do get uh, Victor Matfield on the channel because we're talking about I think him. I think I I'm not sure if I played it because he pl- I think he played in the 2015 World Cup I'm not sure he played in that game that we played though um your game that was the one game I did miss when the Eagles Olympic played the Stadium Springboks. yeah I missed that game because yeah. I was up north for Scotland and Samoa I think because uh, I went to yeah. I went to 17 games in 2015 World Cup. Uh, traveled all over. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, well, I had 18 for Japan. but um, it's committed. No, it is. Well, I've been to every World Cup since 2011. Uh, New Zealand 2011, uh, 2014 for the women in Paris, 2015 in England, 17 matches, uh, 2017 in Ireland for the Women's World Cup again, 2018 for the Sevens in San Francisco, wow. and, then Japan, and then Japan. So I've been to all of them. That's amazing. <laughs> well, all, rugby union, not rugby league. I haven't been to any rugby league World Cups. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's all right. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no, that was um, – I, I, I don't know if he played in that game because, again, I didn't go to see that particular game. But um, when I do get Victor McAfee I'm going to gonna remark to him – about how I miss uh, him being on the spring box because anytime there was a line out, I didn't have anything to worry about. I guarantee that, that he was going to get the line yeah, out. Yeah. And, uh, and, yeah. if he, and if he went up against the opposition, probably about 33% of the time we could count on a steal, which was kind of... Yeah, uh, but, sure. So Brian O'Driscoll, uh, one of my favorite rugby players of all time. He was brilliant for Ireland. Um, and uh, how did, He must have been a lot of fun to play with that guy. Yeah, well, I never played with him. I played well, against him. I mean, um, I mean against actually, him, yeah. 2000- yeah, 2011 World Cup in in New Zealand. It was, uh, um, yeah. I mean, he's obviously one of the all time great. So uh, that's who, that's who you want to compete against. That's the arena you want to be in, right? You want to play against the best and see how you measure up. No, absolutely, I agree with you. But I, I will confess, um, uh, I, I don't relish the thought of uh, coming up against the Fijians or Samoans uh, running out there on the left wing, because uh, I'm sure they would lay me out. <laughs> those yeah, guys are huge. Uh, I've been laid out a few times. Yeah, <laughs> those guys are huge. <laughs> Yikes! Uh, now there was another question over here from the chat. Uh, let me get to it very quickly here. <laughs> Uh, so this was uh, from Landon once again. He said, uh, and I'll answer this and I'll give you a chance to answer too, but he says, because you have a different perspective having been inside the wire, but he says, since the sevens team is so good, does that hurt the 15s development? Would most of the best players rather play sevens and 15s? I would say that um, our development to this point, and then you jump in a second, uh, with sevens is interesting because a lot of people are introduced to sevens later. They're already athletes doing something else like Perry Baker is playing football, introduced to it, um, and a lot of other players. So I don't know that it's necessarily hurt 15s, but we definitely see See players like Madison Hughes who play both and then have to shift from one to the other. So I'm not really sure that it hurts the mm-hmm. development, but um, uh, I think that because of the stage of where sevens was in the U.S. and where or where the Eagles 15s are at, that uh, maybe in the future it could be a problem. But historically, it's not been a problem. And what are your thoughts on that, uh, uh, Blaine? Do you agree or disagree? No, I, I think they're complementary and they should always be. I don't think one detracts from the other. Um, I think being good in one is is hopefully something that allows you know, greater visibility and something that then trickles down and, and adds to the whole. So, you know, I, I think it, it's, it's a net positive. And again, like sevens, it tends to be a really good, you know, 
development vehicle, which is how I developed. Um, and you know, at that point it made me a better 15s player. So I was, I was a better 15s player on the national team because of my time in the sevens program and vice versa. That, that, that happens as well. No, absolutely. I think that's absolutely true. I, I, when I came back from Africa a few years ago to teach the army war college for my last assignment before I retired, um, I contacted the local uh, rugby club here in Harrisburg and said, Hey, listen, um, can I help out in any way? You're looking for help, for help raising funds. You need someone to be an assistant coach or something like that. <laughs> they tried to get me to play for the sevens team. Like uh, you, you might've missed the part where I'm 50 now. Um, I, I could play sevens, but, but <laughs> I can't catch everybody anymore. A few years ago I was fine, but uh, that's, that's a young man's game. So did you, do you have a preference for either game? Do you, do you find sevens uh, more interesting or 15s more interesting? I think they both have their, their, their strong merits. What I like about sevens is that you have this massive tournament, you just keep playing and playing, and it's 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 you know twenty oh well not twenty four seven, but it's a whole day of activity. Whereas for fifteens, it's a single game you got to build up for. But do you have a preference, or did you like aspects of both? Aspects of both. I, they just both have different demands. They ask different things of you, and uh, and therefore you're challenged in different ways. Which I think as an athlete is is kind of what you want. I mean, you're, you're right. It, sevens it tends to be for a younger athlete who's able to bounce back quicker and quicker, um, you know, 15s, you know, being able to visualize and see and strategize and know what, what the pictures are, um, that you're seeing and how those kind of, um, might lead to certain things is, is all, you know, helpful information. So it tends to sort of track that way, I think. No, I think that's a great, great, a great point to make about it. I, I, um, I've never played sevens. I've just played fifteen, so I really can't speak from a player standpoint. But watching the game, it seems to me that um, it is very different. And I would say, you know, for the twenty nineteen World Cup, uh, the Springboks, who won it, of course, uh, I don't. Uh, Rossi Rasmus, the team he picked. Um, I've always said from the moment he picked the team that uh, maybe not the all the best players in all the positions, but I think he probably picked the best team. And I, I think that it's just a World Cup where we've seen a team that was probably the best team and brought the best elements together. And of course his substitution squad uh, plan with the, uh, with the bomb squad, bringing people in, it was like watching, you know, any opponent they play against uh, for the first half, they, they, everyone's out there, you're getting tired, you come out for the second half and then you get 10 minutes in the second half and boom, they bring out replacements and they're as good as the starters or better. And so you just get knackered pretty quickly. Uh, I think that, uh, that was a really interesting aspect of this World Cup. And, of course, the Springboks are the first team to ever lose a pool stage game and actually win the World Cup. Now, you were a player there, so I'll ask you about your experience at the, at the World Cups in a moment. But um, uh, what do you think about the Springboks having won this one in Japan? Um, any thoughts on that one? No, I thought they were well-deserved. I mean, I, they, they had the right strategy. They had the right tactic, tactics, and they had the personnel to, to do it. Um, you know, they knew their strength was physicality and set piece. And, they leaned into it, uh, but I mean, they had some dynamic back, back set that, that they could use as well. Once they were able to beat you up at front. So, I mean, I thought tactically they were brilliant. They, they were physically prepared for how they wanted to play and, and they executed, which is the game. So the Japan itself, I have to say this. I mean, I've always wanted to go to Japan. I'd never been. And, um, I wasn't, for a microsecond disappointing experience. The Japanese were amazing. The venues were top notch, at least from a fan's perspective. I wasn't in locker room, so I can't speak to that, but but um, I, I really, really enjoyed it. It was a great experience, and uh, I was so excited that uh, I got to go. I did go to all of the Eagles games, so I saw you out there at all the games, and then I did go to all the Springboks games, uh, but that was a bit of a challenge to get to all those games. Uh, did you have a favorite game in the World Cup in 2019 that stands out? Well, I agree with you. It's, it was my favorite World Cup, actually, of the three that I competed in. Um, I mean, it's hard to sort of pick out a, a favorite. Um, I suppose, like the England game was was a it was a tough a tough game, but the stadium was amazing um, and a great way to kind of kick off the World Cup. Uh, although competitively frustrating, um, yeah, the the French French game was 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 a tough context for for 60 70 minutes um yeah i love the argentina match it was a beautiful day there's tons of kids in the stands waving flags and you know the tonga game was was tough um yeah i ended up getting injured that game but um which ended up being my last usa game which is i guess fitting in a way but um yeah so it's hard to kind of pick out a favorite but overall i mean i i just loved my time there 
Well, of those games, I have to be honest. Um, I, I stayed in the uh, the Hilton there, and I didn't know you guys were staying in the Hilton. So I, I'm a Hilton Diamond member, so I booked the Hilton, and I'm like, oh, look, the team's here. Uh, so I said hey to a bunch of guys. But uh, I uh, at that game, I sat uh, with Hanko Hemishoy's uh, mom, and uh, – it was absolutely brilliant uh, against France. Uh, that 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 game was uh, getting to the stadium was a bit of a headache because of where it was at for for a fan. But but a beautiful stadium. And I'm telling you, the French were all cocky. Their fans, they're running their mouths all around the you know the family and supporter section there at the stadium. They're running their mouths. Uh, and the second half, they got nervous. They got quiet till about the 67th minute. That was uh, look the Eagles. I think you guys played out of your minds that up th- that six. It, I think it, it, I mean you can tell me if you agree or disagree, but I think people got tired. But um, the, so much effort was put in. It was such an amazing, exciting game that uh, even if you were a fan of, of Le Bleu, you had to appreciate the level of rugby that was being played for those first sixty minutes. Which just it was unbelievable from a fan's perspective. So thanks a lot for that game. That was uh, that was brilliant. We really enjoyed it. Yeah, appreciate that. Now we, uh, I, 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 uh, I, I got excited there. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't make the claim, but I'm like, oh, I sense an upset. This is kind of exciting. I sense an upset, and and that alone made it worthwhile. It was a great experience. Um, the last game, the Tonga game, that was um, a bit frustrating because I thought we had that in the bag. I really thought we were going to win that game, um, and 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 the boys put up a good effort out there. As you said, you got injured in that game, but um, that was an interesting arena there. Um, the crowd was pretty cool, and it was an awful lot of Japanese at that game um, because they're the ones bought most of the tickets for that game. But I really enjoyed that venue. But as a player, um, did you uh, – you mentioned the England game. I, I should mention after the England game, I actually went back to the hotel where you guys were staying at and had, had dinner with the team that evening. I sat down with um, – who was I sitting with? Um, who's the guy from New Zealand who plays for the Eagles? Um, what's his name? Big guy. Uh, drawing a blank right now. Anyway, it'll come to me later. But, uh, yeah, I sat down and actually had dinner with you guys because I was invited by, by a couple of the, the players and their family. said, come down and sit down with us. I didn't eat till everybody else was done eating, but uh, I did in, enjoy that experience, the hotel there in Kobe. That was quite interesting. But the England game, was that was had to be a tough game because England was just they – were, they were a strong opponent. Yeah, they, they were. And, and uh, I mean, at that, after, after that week, weekend, I, I mean, I think everyone knew that they were likely going to end up in the final, um, you know, potentially – take the whole thing which you know they they you know play a couple of times uh them versus south africa maybe you would say it's 50 50 but you know south africa ended up on top obviously but yeah england was an incredible um you know opponent um and they did a lot of things that challenge us in a lot of ways that you know actually you know i like to think helped us in the end get to where we needed to be but the margins are just so thin in, in, in test match level rugby and especially at a World Cup. It's just brutal. Well, you've had some great coaches with USA Rugby. Mike Tolbert was there. You've had John Mitchell, which was an interesting time. Um, he coached the team largely from South Africa and came back periodically. And then Gary Gold came in. And I, I got to say, thrilled to death with the results Gary's gotten and with, with, with the boys who put out there on the pitch. It was a very exciting season a couple of years ago. Essentially, a, a, you know, a, a unbeaten test season was pretty cool. Two Americas, Rugby's Championships trophies. That had to be very awesome to see the Eagles uh, pull that off too. I mean, that's to my knowledge, that's the first – championship of any sorts we've won because we didn't win the pacific nations cup did we i, th- I think that's the first time we won was america's rugby championship since the olympics yeah I, th- I think that's correct yeah yeah so that was pretty cool uh good stuff all right so you've um you've retired from test rugby and uh, now you're going to go work this executive program we've talked about some of the things you're going to do but in the meantime you're you're staying at home dad there uh, helping raise your your newborn that's 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 got to be some exciting stuff for you and your spouse yeah, well, it's it's uh, like I said, it's uh, it's been actually one of the highlights of this period of time is spending so much time with with the both of them, really, um, and my family who's local here, and you know, kind of just always being able to put things in perspective day in and day out around what's really important. Absolutely. Uh, there's uh, the brew is asking you. So, <laughs> all right, fair enough, bro. He says, uh, "Do you have a prediction for the next r- world world r- or rugby world cup champions?" I think that's a tough one because uh, COVID's yeah. really messed up everything. We don't know where we're at. Yeah, yeah. I mean, shoot. Ho- hopefully, uh, yeah. Hopefully, we have some meaningful international competitions for the rest of the world. Uh, <laughs> I mean, because US unfortunately hasn't been able to play this this calendar year. So. Um, yeah, I, I think there'll be some interesting contenders. I mean, I think England and South Africa are definitely up there. I mean, obviously the All Blacks as well. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that they're the three of those teams are are in a really good position. But I like actually France being being a team to surprise people. 
No, I, uh, I, um, I'm obviously, uh, uh, well, not obviously, but I'm famously a um, not supporter of the All Blacks, not a fan at all. <laughs> I respect but don't like the All Blacks, and so I reveled in their defeat to the Wallabies uh, recently, and then they lost to the Pumas last week. I was very excited about that. Uh, but uh, yeah, no, you can never count the All Blacks out. That's probably why I don't like them. Yeah, they're always they're always there. They're always lurking around. I mean, it's such a big part of the game. When I was there for the the World Cup in 2011, you were there obviously as a player, but uh, as a fan running around, and I got to nine matches in 2011. Uh, everywhere I went, there were no, when there weren't games going on during the week or something like that. There's kids out playing rugby. That's just what they were doing everywhere. Outside my hotel, I went down to the. Um, to the, um, the the hot springs and uh, was it uh, I can't I can't remember the name right now it begins with a W but then went down to a, a glacier and went skiing during the World Cup and you guys were you guys were playing rugby I went skiing as well which was pretty awesome because they have snow on the glacier but uh, everywhere I went kids are playing rugby and it's that's just what they do they, the moment they come out of the crib they're playing rugby and gee it's not a surprise why they they're just so good at rugby consistently but uh, did you have a favorite memory of New Zealand from 2011? Oh, I love New Zealand. It's an unbelievable country. And I, I loved it for that fact. I mean, you go get your haircut. They ask you why you made, missed a tackle on the weekend. But, um, yeah, I just – everything about New Zealand. I, I love the people. I loved I loved the country. Um, and, yeah, we had a, an incredible experience, our welcome ceremony, where we, we had uh, – we, we were able to go spend some time in a traditional Maori village and have, uh, have our caps presented to us and – it was just a, a very cool, unique experience for us. Rotorua, that's the place. I couldn't think it was Rotorua. That's where I went where they had the mud. But it's kind of like going to Yellowstone where you've got the geysers or ge geysers, they like to call them. They prefer to call them. Pretty interesting place. Yeah, no, New Zealand was, was absolutely brilliant. No regrets. I really enjoyed it. Um, I would say that before 2019, it was hands down my favorite Rugby World Cup. England was great, but, but – um, uh, it was uh, New Zealand just had a special feeling, but Japan just blew everybody away. That was unbelievable, unbelievable experience. Um, so um, you've 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 been away for it for now for several months. Are you missing it already? I miss I miss elements. Uh, definitely the changing room, uh, the routine. You know, kind of the feedback. I love it's like where am I at versus where I was at yesterday versus you know where my opposition's at, and obviously the scoreboard was the ultimate feedback. Um, yeah. Do I miss like waking up Sunday and not being able to walk? No, no, <laughs> no, not at all. Uh, but for sure. I mean, I always miss, I'll miss elements of, of, of the arena, but I mean, everything has its time and that time for me is, is past now. Absolutely. Well, maybe perhaps uh, depending on what you do after this, uh, maybe if you if you hang around the broadcasting a bit, and maybe you can, you know Brian Habana famously is like a goodwill ambassador for World Rugby, and and Dolan Stanford is uh, become the uh, yeah. broadcaster extraordinaire. So maybe you can fill a role like that, and you can enjoy the game and be close to the game, but wake up Sunday morning and, and not be suffering. <laughs> maybe, yeah, they get beat up on Twitter, yeah, instead. Oh, well, Twitter. We'll see how long Twitter lasts. <laughs> <laughs> Twitter's in the doghouse with so many people right now on both sides of the aisle uh, when it comes to politics. It's yeah. a frustrating thing for them. But uh, somebody said naughty, Chris. What did I say that was naughty? I didn't say anything naughty here. Anyway, uh, so um, before we get you off um, – well, let me ask that question. So you play with a lot of interesting players on the U.S. side. You play with Todd Clever. You were a co-captain with him. Uh, do you have any favorite experiences from being an Eagle that uh, you might want to share? That, that, one that's not going to get you in any trouble because I'm sure there's always stories. No, that... <laughs> yeah. No, I'd say that, that Scotland match is is, uh, is a really – Is this the one in Houston that we, won, that we won 30 to 29? Yeah. yeah. I mean, and, and probably for not the reasons that, that people would think of like uh, just the win. It's, it's more around the process and the journey and – you know, the mindset and the preparation and just kind of being able to share that with that group, I think was, was a really highlight for me. Um, and, you know, obviously yeah, as a sportsman, you probably, most people will look at the results stuff, but it's, for me, it was always, it was always about the locker room and, and the process that I really enjoyed, which then made that stuff meaningful. No. So there's a nice comment here from Janse van Rensburg from South Africa. He said he's always enjoyed watching you play. And always, you always look like the gentleman on and off the, the pitch. Wow, that's very kind of him. Thank you. <laughs> well, uh, my mom will be happy about that. <laughs> yeah, she'll know she raised you right then. That's some good stuff there. 
Um, well, I've been a um, I've been a fan of the Springboks since I was introduced to rugby uh, as a freshman at university, not as a player, but uh, one of the upperclassmen in the ROTC program said, "Hey, you coming to the uh, to the game tonight?" I'm like, "It's Friday. The game's tomorrow." He goes, "No, not football, man. Rugby." I'm like, uh, you know, I'm from Appalachia. We're happy to have electricity and pave roads, which, by the way, is not much of an exaggeration. Um, and he said, no, 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 it'll be fun. Come on down. I said, I've, I've never watched the game. I've heard of it. And I went down, and we were standing in touch because there were no bleachers or anything like that on the band fields where the band would practice at Ohio University. And I'm watching the game go back and forth. I'm like, okay, it's not Australian rules football. It's not American football. This is cool. I like this. And afterwards, of course, you know, I think one one side got slaughtered. It must have been like 50-something to nil. But afterwards, everybody's hanging out and having a beer, and we're all getting along. I'm like, this is a cool game. I like it. And that was my introduction to rugby. And, of course, there's no professional rugby. There's no club sports around me. Uh, we didn't even have a club team at the university. Just some, some guys got together to play it. And um, I uh, couldn't watch it on television. But I became a fan pretty quickly. And as a history student, I looked at uh, – what are the teams that have done really well historically? And, of course, England and Ireland and France. And, and I saw that South Africa had been historically one of the best teams in world rugby. I'm like, hmm, South Africa. I like Africa. Okay, so I became a Springboks fan. And then, of course, in 84, we finally got a national team once again. So, I, But but it wasn't well known at the time. So I became a Springboks fan and have, and have stayed one all along. But, of course, I've been an Eagles fan. So the only time it's difficult for me is when the Eagles play the Springboks. And the one chance that, or the two chances I've had to the catch them in the World Cup, I missed both those games. So, so I've never had to root against the Eagles for, against when they're playing the Springboks. So that's been a good it's break a good for me. What's that? It's a good tactic. Yeah, no, it works out pretty well. Always oh, just miss it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Just missed that game. No, the uh, the the uh, the 2015 World Cup was fascinating for me uh, because, of course, you know Japan won that big game against the Springboks. But then the last game I went to for that World Cup was you guys against Japan. And uh, Eddie Jones was uh, coaching Japan, as you remember, and um, it, people were warming up on the pitch, and I was sitting right in the middle, um, up uh, close to the press box, but just below where the coaches sit. And Eddie came up, uh, came up the steps to go to the box, you know, where the coaches sit. And as he came up, I, he had just signed with uh, with the Stormers, with Western Province, and I'm a Stormers Western Province fan, so I'm like, hey, Eddie, thanks a lot for signing with the Stormers Western Province. What I didn't know is he'd already agreed to coach England at this point, so, so it was a little premature. And then, uh, but I don't blame him. I mean, a chance to coach uh, a Curry Cup or Super Rugby team versus a national side like England, you got to take the England. And then, of course, they ran off this long streak of, of win after win after win did you um did you did you have a, a a memory from the 2015 world cup that might be interesting or um let's see no i mean it was a it was a it was a, another great experience and again like any opportunity you have to be in the world cup is 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 something worth remembering um yeah i, I had a few injuries in that tournament which which made it tougher for me but um yeah, Olympic Stadium was was against the Springbok was pretty special for sure. Absolutely. Well, listen, Blaine, um, it, it's been fascinating to have you on. I really appreciate coming on, and good luck at Oxford. That, uh, that should be interesting. Um, what what got you interested in Oxford? Is it um, just a great program or an opportunity to go back to the U.K. and a great program? Or Yeah, I think a bit of that, a bit of both for sure. I mean, it's something I've wanted to do for a long time. I, I've, I've looked at the university while I was overseas, and – I love my international experience and I'm kind of keen to, you know, kind of lean into that. And, and, uh, Oxford is, is obviously a, a, a pretty impressive academic institution. So, you know, opportunity to challenge myself in a, in an environment like that is something I'm really looking forward to. Well, I've been eyeing a PhD program at King's College uh, over there and also um, another one up there at Leeds, a couple programs. Um, so not sure I want to go do a PhD right now, but uh, I've been thinking about it. Maybe if the COVID goes away, maybe maybe I'll see you over there somewhere in the UK, uh, somewhere in the future. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah, uh, before we go it. off, no worries. That'd be fantastic. Um, you're in Jersey now. You're not that far away. But with COVID, you might as well be on the other side of the world, the way things are going. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> in order to come back into Pennsylvania, I'll have to be quarantined, apparently, according to my governor. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Who yeah. now expects us to wear a mask in our homes and in our cars as we go about our business. That's the new standard here in Pennsylvania. So we'll see how that goes. But uh, so um, – before we close out, let me just uh, give you a chance. Any last thoughts you want to talk about rugby in general or life or, or you know, you have a, it seems like you have a great positive outlook on life. You've got your head screwed on straight. Anything you'd like to share with anybody before we close out? No, I, I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, again, I hope everyone's doing safe and well, and, and hopefully everyone's able to sort of balance the current frustration with maybe future hope. So uh, just try to 
I always try to give myself a cue, cue reminder. And I'm, I'm always helped by changing diapers at three o'clock in the morning that yeah, there, there is, even though it's just not the most fun thing in the world, I, was there, is there something I'd rather be doing in that moment or would, would I be happier anywhere else? And I'd probably not. So it's just, you know, taking some time to remember to be grateful and, and I'm grateful for my time in the game and uh, what it's given me and the opportunities and experiences I've had and, you know, grateful for your time and, and uh, hopefully we can do it again soon. No, that'd be fantastic. Uh, Blaine, uh, listen, thanks a lot. It's a pleasure having you on the channel um, for the Rugby Ascendant segment of my program. Really enjoyed it. And I know the Leicester fans loved you, but um, we enjoyed you as an Eagle and really appreciated the effort you put in. Uh, as you, you you didn't complain about it, but you did note, uh, you mentioned, you know, waking up Sunday can be a bit rough. Um, so it takes a lot to go out there in a pitch and take those hits. And um, also the brilliant moves and the great tries. Really enjoyed it. Uh, so thanks a lot for all you did for USA Eagles Rugby and uh, for being the captain. I appreciate that. No, you're most welcome. Thank you. We really appreciate having you uh, as an Eagle and um, look forward to the next chapters you've got going in life. So thanks a lot. All right, Chris. Thanks so much. All right. Well, folks, that's Blaine Scully as he drops off there. Um, I'll close out the program here. I'll give him a chance to drop off there. And uh, thank you, uh, Blaine, so much for being my guest today. Really did appreciate your presence here. I didn't mention I'm actually wearing a Wales uh, polo from 2015, <laughs> Wales Rugby Union here. Uh, as folks know, on my program, I traditionally on my uh, live streams wear some sort of rugby jersey or polo of some sort. Anyway, folks, thanks for tuning in. My special thanks to Blaine Scully. He was a fantastic guest. I hope you guys found it informative, learned a little bit about him and about USA Rugby and also a little bit about uh, his experience in college and about the game here in the U.S., which is uh, it's a popular game. It's just not well known that it's popular. So maybe we can change that narrative for the USA uh, with rugby going forward. Anyway, thanks a lot to Blaine. Folks, uh, President Donald Trump is doing a press conference right now. I'm going to drop off and, uh, and restart a stream and carry that with commentary and to see what the president has to announce, uh, whether he is um, dropping his election challenge, results challenges, or he's pursuing them further, what's actually happening here. So it should be interesting. Uh, if I can get that feed up, I'll do a stream here in about five or 10 minutes. So thank you guys so much. Appreciate you for tuning in to the stream. And uh, I will do a Night Owls edition here a little bit later on. And we'll be talking about the, um, the reprehensible behavior of, of the Polizei in Germany and their abuse of uh, private citizens. Um, we'll take a look at that and discuss further issues about what's happening around the world in the news of the day. Thank you so much for that, folks. I appreciate it. Smash the like button if you don't mind, those who are here. Really appreciate that. And we'll catch you all later. Uh, well, later, maybe in five or 10 minutes if I can get a stream going. Anyway, we'll catch you either then or we'll catch you later on the evening stream and the Night Owls edition. Thanks a lot, everybody. God bless. And we'll catch you a little bit later on. Appreciate your watching and your patronage. <laughs>